Okay. Hi, uh, welcome everyone to the EI seminar. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Zico Kotar. Uh, Zico is an associate professor in the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon and also serves as a chief scientist of AI research at Bosch Center for Artificial Intelligence. His work spans the intersection of machine learning optimization with a large focus on developing more robust and rigorous methods in deep learning. In addition, he has worked in a number of application areas, highlighted by his work on sustainability and smart energy systems. He is a recipient of the DARPA Yun Faculty Award, a Sloan Fellowship, and Best Paper Awards on NeurIPS, ICML, AI Stats, IJKI, KDD, and PESGM. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Zico Kotar. All right. This is the first seminar talk I've given in uh two, at least two years, as we all know, right? So forgive me if I'm a bit rusty on these things, I'll do my best. If you prefer if I have a mask off, mask on, does it, does it matter? Uh, no, it doesn't matter, okay. I can leave it off, uh, leave it on, and then if you can't hear me, the audio seems pretty good, so I think we can, I think we, 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 we couldn't roll with it. All right, so it is wonderful to be here, um, and I'm excited to talk today about our work in deep equilibrium models. Um, this work, I've, I've talked about different aspects of this work at different times. I actually gave a talk virtually at MIT here a year ago on a lot of the same stuff. So I'm gonna to try to sort of split, you know, right down the middle here by talking some basics about these methodologies for those that weren't at my previous talks. You know, I can't, I don't wanna assume that everyone knows about this stuff, but, um, but I also wanna offer some, of, some, some sort of new insights into our, into our sort of where we're going in this area right now, all right? So I'm gonna to try to do both. Uh, so, so, uh, Feel free to stop me more in the earlier portions if it, that is better for everyone just to get the basic ideas or we can skip over it and get to the new cool stuff if you're bored and, and want to see the latest and greatest. But I should start off by saying, of course, this is you know the, the, the work of many students, um, highlighted actually by the person on the left, Shao Bai, who has really been the lead on all these efforts here. And I am really looking forward to uh, continuing to work with, with many of them. All right, so let's jump right in, talking about deep equilibrium models and et cetera, et cetera, with the, with the rest of the title. Okay, so what's this talk about? Um, this talk is about the story we all tell about deep learning. I work in deep learning. Uh, I like deep learning. I, I really do. I think it's, I think it's amazing. Um, I know if you all saw this, these, uh, like every week something comes out that kind of, despite knowing how it works exactly, I'm always shocked by it. This week it was Dolly, like two days ago, Dolly 2 by OpenAI. It's incredible. You type like, I don't know, I, 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 forget, I forget the things, but you know, like two uh, teddy bears on the moon working on AI in the 80s. And it's like shows a picture that looks just like that, right? So it's, it's, it's insane how these things are working. Um, and despite knowing about how these work, <laughs> I'm constantly uh, in awe of just how cool it is. Um, but what I want to talk about today is sort of the story we tell about deep learning. The story we tell in some sense is that when you have a deep network, it processes data in a hierarchical fashion, right? So early levels, <laughs> early, la early layers, uh, uh, like do things like edge detection. Then later layers, you have like parts of objects and finally you assemble these into whole objects and somehow the network is identifying these things, right? Um, actually, this is, you've probably seen this picture before. I have an affinity for this picture because it was, I remember my, it, was, it was from my office mate in grad school. It was on this paper and I just saw so many iterations of that figure like as it was being developed and now it's become like part of the lore of deep learning. So I, I love this figure. Um, but what I want to argue today is that this picture, to a certain extent, is wrong, or at least an incomplete understanding of how deep learning works. And so what I'm going to argue in this talk is that we can actually replace this entire traditional hierarchy of depth with a single layer. But the difference is, but this is not like a universal approximation kind of thing, a single layer with same number of parameters as our, as our you know, traditional deep network. But what we're going to do, we need to do to do that, is we're going to have to replace what we mean by our notion of a layer from a basically an explicit layer or a compute graph kind of representation to one that is based upon implicit, basically root solving instead. 
And this is a framework. I'll talk about this, of course, but I mean by that in a second. This is a framework we call the deep equilibrium model. And it has many advantages. So it's, I think, simpler, simpler architecturally. Um, just from a practical standpoint, it has reduced memory complexity. And it typically matches or exceeds performance of traditional network structures. And what I'm arguing today is, and, and not only that, but I think, you know, in addition to sort of these basic uh, properties of it, there's also been a great deal of ongoing work that we and others have done in these models that actually has started to really not just sort of match performance, but really surpass performance and achieve, in some cases, state-of-the-art performance on, on some domains of interest. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as well. So that's the other talk. I'm going to go talk about how you go from uh, deep networks to shallow networks, but where shallow now means shallow but implicit. Um, yes, a bit further. It's too loud. I'm, I'm too enthusiastic and loud. Let me, let me. All right. The better to zoom everyone. Sorry, don't mean to be, you know, too, too oppressive here. Okay, um, <laughs> even with the mask, it's still, I'm glad I left the mask on then. Uh, all right, so let's talk about this, so what we're gonna do today. So what we're gonna do is we're first gonna, I'm first gonna give kind of like, you know, half the talk on the intro to deep equilibrium models. What I mean by that, if you've seen this part of the talk before, this might be some somewhat old news uh, to you, but I wanna give a basis for this and hopefully give some new insights into why I think these things work so well. Then I want to talk about the primary downside of deck models, which is their efficiency. So as great as they are, they have a very big problem, which is they are not as efficient computationally as traditional networks. And our primary efforts over the past, I would say, year and a half, or one thread of our primary efforts has been to make them more computationally efficient. Then finally, I will talk about applications. And this is actually where I get most excited currently, because I think that there are some application areas where decks are particularly well suited and which can actually be cases where these don't just match or do as well as existing networks, but really far exceed the power of existing networks. Okay. And that's going to be kind of the outline, the outline for today. All right. So let's let's start off by just talking about deep equilibrium models. What I mean by this, um, why I'm so excited about these things, and why it is in fact possible. I, I, I say this a lot now, but but why is it possible to embed or to, to, to uh, do away with all depth in deep models and build uh, everything with only a single shallow implicit model. This is really based upon three papers, um, or this section is on three papers, uh, mostly by Xiaoji, but also some work by, by uh, my student Ezra on, on sort of a more theoretically justified and, and, and well-founded class of such models. Okay, so let's jump in with, uh, with talking about deep networks. And in fact, I'm gonna jump right in. I already showed you what a deep network is, right? I think most people here know, roughly speaking, what deep, deep learning models do. Compose many layers uh, together, one after the other. You have things like values in the, in the middle of them, et cetera. Um, the underlying principle of deep learning or underlying principle of deep learning is that depth is good for some reason, right? Deeper networks, for some reason, work better than shallow networks. We don't really understand that fully. I mean, there, there are examples you can make of this, like you know, circuits and stuff like this, but it doesn't really the foundational reason. The, the reality, though, is that deep networks, at least of a certain kind, when you add more layers, the performance of your systems improves. And so, I want to start with, uh, it's a funny thing to start with, um, infinite deep networks. So what a deep network is really is it's, you know, uh, the, the simplest form of a deep network basically is we have some hidden unit Z and we multiply it by some linear function. You know, we apply some linear operator like a matrix multiplier or a convolution or whatever. And then we apply some uh, nonlinearity and we repeat this process, right? Now, of course, real networks are much more structured. We'll move to those in a second, but this is the rough cartoon version of a deep network. And since depth is good, I want to sort of ask the question, why don't we consider sort of this process going to infinity? Why don't we just think about deeper and deeper layers until we have like an infinitely deep network? And um, some people can do that. Actually, Greg can do some of that stuff, but um, I can't actually implement these things because there's a problem here, of course, right? We're doing this sort of in reality, which is that you, your, your number of parameters would also be infinite in these models. So you can't actually do this. You can't actually build an infinitely deep model. So you have to make a few changes to this basic structure in order to represent infinitely deep networks. And this is actually gonna be our starting point for introducing our class of models. 
The two changes you need to make in order to build an infinitely deep network is you need to, first of all, introduce some sort of weight tying amongst all your layers. And the simplest thing to do is just make the W, the linear term you apply to all your layers, the same over every stage of the network. Okay. Um, this seems, by the way, like a big, like a like whoa. That's that seems like a really big assumption. It's actually not that big of an assumption. Um, you can, I, I won't really cover it, but you can basically embed any network you can do with finite, any finite depth network you can embed in a uh, a weight tied network by just basically concatenating the different layers together. But this isn't actually that big a restriction. So that's number one. You have to you have to tie the layers together somehow. Um, number two is you actually, and we needed this to be honest in our infinite network to begin with. Um, if your network just sort of iterates the same function over and over again, chances are eventually it will converge to some point that is independent of the input entirely, right? It doesn't matter what the input was, it'll converge to some point. So in order for this to actually depend, this function to depend on the input to the network, like the, you know, the image, X here is the, you know, the image and Y is the class or whatever of, of type of cat that it is in the image, um, you have to have this, this U term here, which re-injects the input at each layer. But if you do this, this is a perfectly valid notion of an infinitely deep network that you can actually model and actually run in practice. I mean, other than the fact that it's infinite, uh, everything else sort of <laughs> is well-defined here. But there is, of course, sort of an interesting thing here. Because if you look at that equation now, you are applying the same function again and again to some sort of state of the system Z. Right, so you can think of Z now, Z is the activation of the network, but in that function, Z looks like a lot like a state of a system, right? Where you're applying the same function again and again to this system. This looks an awful lot like, you know, an autonomous dynamical system. And what happens in practice when you do this, this isn't guaranteed by the way, you can guarantee it in some circumstances, but what happens in practice when you do this is that this operation will converge to some limiting point some equilibrium point where when you apply this operation, the, 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 the fixed point doesn't change. Okay. And this is an equilibrium point of the dynamical model. And really the only key idea of a deep equilibrium model, and um, this is the model that we're gonna sort of talk about this rest of this whole talk here, is that what I want to do is just build networks that find that fixed point directly. We're replacing the whole notion of a traditional network, traditional layers at a time, with a network that just finds an equilibrium point of some single layer, okay? And that's gonna be the primitive operator we're gonna use throughout our, our modeling. And that's gonna be our, our sort of key operation. Okay. Um, Moving forward now. Any questions on that? Because that, that's the sort of the, the fundamental point I want to make sure I have <laughs> this point gotten through. Yes? You said for linear networks, of course, you can, you can compact it to a single W, but when they're not linear networks, then really Oh, no, you see, you, you, yeah, so it's a great question. So um, you can, even for nonlinear networks, to make it into a single W, you, you have to just expand the size of your state. So if you, if you have a finite, so, so for a finite size network, right? You can represent that finite size network as a similar weight tied network of, of, of similar depth, of the same depth as your, as your fixed point network by just taking each state you have, uh, stacking them all together and having like your, your, your single W be like a shift operator applied to these. So it's, it's a trivial mapping, it's a, but it is one that, that works. So you don't lose anything representationally or parameter wise even by by going to the fix, to the um, to the weight tied network. All right. Now I should also mention this is not fundamentally a new idea in deep learning. This has been explored for a very long time under the name of of uh, recurrent backpropagation and some of the original current networks. Because by the way, that was a whole lot like a recurrent kind of stack, right? That, that that's that's very similar there. Um, it also is very similar to neural ODEs. Neural ODEs are kind of like a continuous time version of this thing. This is a more discrete time version of this. It's also, but it's also like infinite limits, not like a finite time thing. It's sort of a, an infinite limit kind of thing. Um, and there's a lot of actually background also on, on modern networks that use weight tying, 
even not for this purpose, but just incidentally, um, things like universal transformers or alpha fold too uses actually a lot of weight tying in its, in its network. So the first two things I wanna say here are this network, and maybe this is the point I made before so I can sort of skip a lot of this, but this representation is sufficient to capture very rich structures of networks because sort of theoretically speaking, X is, um, you know, X being all you need is like a trope now in, in machine learning, including I'm guilty of publishing papers, but you know, kind of make fun of that similar trope. But um, the claim I'll make here is that this is actually all you need. One layer is all you need, but really from a, from a truly representational standpoint, it's all you need. Not from, again, not from a universal representation standpoint, but from a standpoint of just being able to capture this, the, the, the representational power of a network, one layer is all you need. And the reason is exactly what we had before. If you have a multi-layer network, you can just stack these things and apply like a shift operator to represent your full network with a single layer network. The other cool thing though, is that, you know, the first thing we do in deep learning is that when we find a good representation, we like wanna stack those things. Like let's have multiple equilibrium layers and stack those together. But the really cool thing about this notion of a fixed point is that it, it gains nothing from stacking. You can also take any set of equilibrium computations. So, you know, find equilibrium in one state, then treat its output as input to the next one. You can represent that similarly by just stacking the states together and finding a joint equilibrium over both of them. So one layer is both sort of necessary and sufficient in some sense to represent any sort of uh, stacking of, of, of equilibrium models themselves. Doesn't address major other points like uniqueness, stability, those kind of stuff. We'll get to those in a little bit. That's the that's the basic idea. Yeah, Greg. Maybe one way to let's see the side more uh equilibrium models the depth can't convert um that's true. Yeah. So the, the, the question is like, can can you convert are you effectively converting depth to width? So to be clear, we don't do that stacking because that would be really inefficient um, and com computationally a really bad idea, <laughs> right? Um, but I think conceptually, yes. Like if you have some fixed parameter budget and you have like a very deep network, you can, and if, if you transition that to just one layer, you will have a wider layer. Right? You, you, your layer will be wider by, by square root factor of the depth. And that is essentially... And practically speaking, too, because often we compare on sort of per parameter counts, it does seem like a slightly wider layer with repeated application captures a lot of the same practical representational power as depth does. Yeah. So in that, uh, in that situation, would you expect that the average number of iterations we do is four paths? Let's talk about four iterations in a second. Because yes, but actually this is the point I'm gonna make here. So let's talk about implementing DEX. How do we implement this, right? What I said was our goal is just to find an equilibrium point, but, but how do we find that point, right? And then more importantly, if we're gonna use this in deep learning, how do we backprop through it? Because you need to differentiate through these things. How does that work? So I wanna make three points. The first is that I'm saying that like one layer is all you need, but the reality is um, that's not quite true. In reality, we find equilibrium points of sort of functions look like, that look like this, where this function f is more like a cell in traditional deep networks. So it's like a transformer cell or like a residual cell, right? So it's somewhere in between a literal single layer and a, you know, nice, relatively compact compute block, okay? That's point number one. Point number two is how do we compute the forward pass? I sort of said you, all you have to do is find the solution. Um, with that in a second. Secondly, how do you compute the backward pass? If you work out the chain rule here, you'll have a term that, that, where, where, where you need to compute the derivative of a Jacobian of, or multi computed vector Jacobian product with respect to, the Jacobian of your equilibrium point with respect to your parameters or with respect to the input to the function, right? And that's not obvious how you do that. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a complicated operation there. How do I differentiate that? So I'm gonna address each of these now um, because these are both sort of central to actually implementing DEX in practice. So the first point I wanna make is, in, is about the forward pass. Now, one thing we could just do in our forward pass is we could just iterate our function. 
right? We just take, you know, initialize z to be zero, um, apply the function and iterate this. This is sort of the simplest dynamics we could have the system. And as long as those dynamics are stable, you know, then we, you know, and a bunch of other assumptions, which <laughs> are typically not satisfied by these networks, but, but, but sort of work still in practice, um, we, will, we will converge. But the reality is this is quite slow, right? So doing this this way is quite slow and doesn't really take advantage of the nature of deep equilibrium models. Because the whole point of a deep equilibrium model is it doesn't actually matter how we find the equilibrium point. All that matters is finding that equilibrium point. Now, it's not trivial to find, of course, but there are a whole bunch of accelerated methods for finding equilibrium points of functions. Thing like, things like Anderson acceleration or Broyden's method. Um, these are standard accelerated quasi-Newton methods for finding the roots more quickly. And so what we actually do in practice, is we don't just iterate the function forward. We actually run something like Anderson acceleration, which is written here. The, the details aren't important, but this is the, this is, it's just as simple um, to find the next, the next state. Um, and I mean, the, the, the key idea of Anderson is it's like, it's not just a single combination. It's like multiple previous combinations you're using to form the next iterate. And to, to Greg, to your point, um, I'll talk about sort of compute power in a little bit, but the, at a high level, um, you require roughly as many, I mean, it depends on your architecture, of course, right? But like, it's on the same order of the number of forward applications you need for your original network to do this, but it has some advantages. Like, if you have a good initial point, you can really amortize that very well. If you have, a, if, you know, the number of iterations you need naturally kind of varies with the complexity in many cases of the actual example you're trying to solve and like very nice things like this. Okay. okay, so then the second question was, how do we compute the backward pass of the deck model? How do we differentiate um, the fixed point with respect to the parameters of our network? And for this, we're also gonna use a really nice uh, theorem here called the implicit function theorem, also goes back many, Hundreds of years, I guess. <laughs> um, but the idea is actually the implicit function theorem, technically speaking, that's what guarantees the existence of this function. It's not how you do it. But the basic idea is if you have some fixed point condition like this that we know is satisfied by the solution, we can compute derivatives by differentiating this function, by differentiating both sides of the function and solving for the unknown. So here, for example, we're going to differentiate both sides. Um, this gradient here is the thing that we don't know. Uh, we just apply the chain rule to the right hand side. That splits things up a little bit. Um, the key point here is that the terms besides the thing that we don't know are all easily computed by automatic differentiation. So we can easily compute using the automatic differentiation tool, all those, all those other terms there. And then we get a linear equation for our unknown uh, Jacobian. Okay. And um, in practice, of course, this is still a really big inverse. We can't format or invert it, but we're going to use something like Anderson to actually form and invert that as well. So we just use also an accelerated solver or like CG or a concrete gradient or something like that you can use too. We're gonna to use a different sort of solver to solve our um, backward pass as well. Okay, and this, is this is called implicit differentiation. It's, it's also fairly well known, but it's, but it's sort of a nice property you can use here. Now, I, I do wanna mention sort of one point that, 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 that's, that's really crucial to this, which, which is that an, an alternative we could do is we could take whatever solution procedure we use to compute our solution and just treat that as a compute, as, as a compute graph and backprop through that. But importantly, I'm actually advocating to not do that. Don't do that. If you do that, you have to maintain in memory every intermediate iterate of your computation. With this approach, with implicit differentiation, you can actually just find the solution and then throw away all intermediate iterates to actually get there and differentiate analytically through the solution. And that can be much, much more memory efficient, uh, even in the traditional networks, right? Because you, you don't need to maintain all of your intermediate iterates of your function. Now, of course, there are other ways to be more memory efficient too. There are things like, you know, um, caching only certain uh, hidden units and recomputing them as needed, stuff like this. But this is a very natural and sort of easy way to maintain basically constant memory consumption through an infinitely deep network 
infinite in sort of <laughs> in, in some sense, also single layer in another sense, um, without having to sort of do anything special, just falls naturally out of the computation. Now, if you want sort of some more details here, I should mention that um, Matt Johnson, David Divino, and I actually gave a tutorial uh, year before last at NeurIPS on this. And along with that tutorial, we have a very detailed set of notes online at implicitlayerstutorial.org. Um, we have code there that actually will go through the implementation of how you implement one of these in either JAX or PyTorch. And you can kind of see how this actually works. It's not very long. It's like 20 lines of code that will give you a, a deep equilibrium model. Maybe more if you have to implement Anderson, but uh, you know, 40 lines of code maybe to implement one of these things. All right, let's see if this actually works. So, so here's an example on language modeling. Wikitest 103 is a standard language modeling task. And the point I want to make here is that we're going to look at different model sizes because, of course, you know, language modeling is something that vastly improves with bigger models um, and more data. But the point I want to make here is that if you look at standard architectures like a transformer or a um, Charles Net, another architecture that we've worked on a fair amount, and compare the deck version on the right with the normal version on the left, what we get typically is that the deck version performs, gets better performance um, and uses vastly less memory than the traditional explicit depth version of the same, basically the same architecture with the same number of parameters, matching parameters. Now, how you get those parameters is different, right? Because, you, you know, uh, you, you do have one layer, see so that layer itself is a little bit bigger than the previous layers, but even with that, you're vastly reducing memory requirements while you also um, have, a, have a better performing network. And to be clear, yeah, we haven't like <clears throat> we haven't always run this on the biggest models possible because we just, I mean, I guess this is a few years ago now, we could probably run this one now, um, but we don't often, right? We sort of leave the bigger models to the people that really want to do it. Um, but we, we do, uh, for a given size model, these things are very competitive, um, usually as good if not better. Okay, um, any questions so far on this? Yes. Yes, exactly. So, like, like a transform. When I say like a deck transformer, what I mean by that is that this function, like this f, this f function here, that's like a single transformer layer. So, transformer is just you know you have like a self attention followed by two, like a like by two feed forward networks. And so, what I mean, but but then in a normal transformer, you stack a whole bunch of these together. So what I mean by those things is you're just taking a transformer cell. So you're just taking some attention to and for mixing and then two uh, feed forward networks in the, in the channel dimension. Um, you're just only doing one of those and you are um, iterating and finding a fixed point of that cell function. Okay, now, um, going a bit quicker here. Uh, I want to mention a couple. Yes, question before we go quicker. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yes. It's but, but but the cool thing about this too is that the the memory you need actually is only the only the final output. So even the internal like comp compute in the transformer cell itself is not. You don't need to maintain that. So so the memory at the store is just like the actual final hidden activation of a transformer block, yeah. So very efficient for that reason, yes. Has anybody received the representations? Yeah, so I get this question a lot about representations. And the short answer is that, especially given that we have those pictures before, it's like, well, aren't there like edges and then other things? Um, if you look at the representations, they, it's, you can visualize them. They look a little different. But so do like VGG and a ResNet. I, I, I haven't I haven't found a way to like that they significantly differ from this. Um, but let me actually answer that question maybe by also talking about some some other work as well, which is multi-scale deep equilibrium models. Because representations and and depth, especially in visual architectures, really does two, really do two things, right? On the one hand, they are about multiple nonlinearities which is kind of covered by DEX, but they also represent the image at different spatial scales, right? So there, there, there's, you know, 
high level features and low level, like, like high resolution features and low resolution features that sort of capture different aspects of the image, presumably. And so the question is, how do we do that with DEX, right? Like, like we only have one layer, how do we do that? And the solution that we've come up with is this multi-scale deck, because the nice thing is you can actually separate the notion of different spatial scales from different depth scales. So what we do is the following. We take our image and we maintain in our hidden state multiple different resolution of features. And what our sort of single function now is, is it's actually like we take each of these, we put them into a residual block, and we mix them all together by upsampling and downsampling. And this whole thing is our function f. Okay, so our hidden state here is actually the sort of concatenation of all of these hidden states at different spatial scales. And the function f is a joint mixing between all of them. So when this process converges to an equilibrium point, we kind of have a shared set of features that are simultaneously in equilibrium with each other. It's sort of like a UNet style architecture, but like doing all the directions simultaneously, right? Like up, down, and all, all directions kind of at the same time and forcing that whole thing into equilibrium. And then we can sort of find our equilibrium states of all of this and we can apply some loss to this. Now, the cool thing about this that's really nice is that this architecture, because it maintains these resolutions simultaneously can be applied the exact same model to both tasks like semantic segmentation and to image classification, right? So if you want to do classification, you just take the low resolution kind of state of your system, apply a linear layer on that. Or if you want to do semantic segmentation, you know, classify each into the pixel, pixel, take the high resolution version and, 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 and use that. And in fact, what we see is when we do this, we get architectures, and I mean, these are a few years ago now, so with, with proper tweaking, we can do a little better than this now. Um, what we do is we get an architecture that on things like um, on problems like classification do, you know, for similar model sizes, do basically as well as ResNet style architectures, um, again, for similar models, but then nicely on a problem like semantic segmentation, the exact same model does the same thing. It can achieve very similar performance. And so in fact, you know, again, compared with similar models of similar sizes, um, is able to get pretty close to the state of the art on things like cityscapes with no change in model. We're not talking like, there's no backbones here and you know backbones with different feature extractors, stuff like that. It's just one model, that, which is a different you know, head, linear head on each, on, each, on each resolution, is able to get a near state of the art performance on across different visual classification domains. And of course, since, you know, I, I don't get many chances to have pretty videos in my talk. I don't really do robotics and stuff anymore. So uh, I have an obligatory like video on cityscapes. This is, this is not like perfect. We're not doing any temporal smoothing too. So that sort of makes it jitter a lot, but this is pretty good performance for a non-temporally coherent um, semantic segmentation block. All right, so let me very briefly now mention the last thing that I want to about, about uh, deck models, which is that a big issue with this whole framework I talked about is a notion of uniqueness, uniqueness and convergence to a fixed point. How do I know a fixed point even exists? How do I know it's unique? How do I know if I can actually achieve it, right? All these things are not actually clear. Um, what I will mention is that in general, we're going to ignore this. Um, Deep networks, in some sense, have been designed, I would argue, to be stable. If you have a unit that is not stable, then a hundred depth architecture will already diverge. And so there probably is a fixed point. And we find this in practice. In practice, we find with real architectures, there does exist fixed points. You have to do a little bit of conditioning to make sure that, that you, know, you can find them reliably, which we'll talk about in a second. But there are fixed points. However, there, you can't really get guarantees. But if you want guarantees, in another line of work, we've been investigating the connection between these architectures and, and, and sort of a, a um, sort of a, a type, type of sort of a framework called monotone operator theory, which basically provides a, um, a way of understanding the updates of and the fixed points of deck models in a way that actually can guarantee their existence uniqueness. 
And the, the, the high level theory, I don't want to go into this too much because I think, you know, I want to get to the other points because we're running out of time a bit here. But um, if you think about a single layer deck like this, under certain positivity conditions, under certain semi definite positivity conditions, and under the condition that the nonlinearity is like a prox operator, which is, by the way, true for like a ReLU, that's a, that's a prox operator for some function, you actually can guarantee that um, both the deck network has a unique fixed point, and you can also provide hard guarantees on the Lipschitz constants of this, which very interestingly enough actually do not depend on the, 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 the spectral norm of W at all, which is very cool. Um, now, I don't want to get too much into this. The result comes from the fact that you can view this operation as a solution to a monotone operator splitting problem. Um, you can also argue like, are those two assumptions reasonable or not? Um, the second one is that it, like most operators are in fact prox operators uh, for, for, for these um, in most networks, these most monotone, mon monotonic nominaries are in fact prox, prox operators. The, the, the semi-definite condition is actually a lot harder to enforce. And it's literally not true, even if it's true at initialization. So what we do in this framework is we actually enforce that to be true by parameterizing the network in a certain way. So again, we're not going to use this formulation very much because it is limiting. But at a high level, if you want a deck that gives you guarantees about the existence of fixed points, you can get it just through a different parameterization of your network. And you will actually guarantee it, and it's it's still efficient to solve. So that's the that's that, that's the basic idea, sort of the, the punchline there. Okay, so that's that's the first part. I'm more than half an hour in, so <laughs> we'll we'll have to abbreviate the next two parts. But I want to at least give some insight into where, what we've been doing since this first work in Dex. Where where's the effort going, and what do I think are the most exciting things on the horizon for Dex models? Okay, so the first thing I'm going to mention is the single biggest problem of deck models is that they are slower, not, they perform better, they're more memory efficient, but they are also slower than their equivalent, uh, equivalent performing fixed depth network. And the reason is you typically need more iterations of your fixed point solver in order to reach a similar quality solution as a fixed depth network. It's not awful. It's like two to three times worse. I'm not talking like exponentially worse, but no one's gonna need something that's two to three times slower in deep learning because if you have two to three more compute, you just build a bigger model. Um, so this is a big problem. Um, I guess it can even be five X slower in some cases. And so the, the thing I would, so I think I think I said this before. So I said that. So, so basically, the 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 this, this fact of slowness comes from the fact that finding a fixed point actually is slower. Uh, you need more Anderson iterations, even with a nice accelerator like Anderson. You need more Anderson accelerations than you need or Anderson iterations than you need typical depth of a network by a reasonable constant factor. Um, interestingly enough, this actually gets worse as training progresses. So as, as training progresses, you get more and more sort of critically stable. And so you need more and more iterations to find that fixed point. But and this is where we're kind of saved here. There is some, the nice thing about DEX is because we have separated out the solution itself from our procedure for finding that solution, there's a lot we can do to accelerate this process. Um, this separation is lovely, by the way. This is for the same thing of optimization, right? We, we characterize the solution we want, i.e. the fixed point, separately than we characterize the way we go about solving it. Um, so there's a few things we can do to help do this, help control this. Um, the first thing is we can regularize the solution. Now, now just doing things like weight regularization, that doesn't actually, that actually don't work at all. Just put it like an L2 norm penalty on the weights. Doesn't help at all. It actually makes things worse. Because what we actually care about in some sense, I think I'm talking too loudly here again, sorry for the Zoom crowd. I get excited about these things. Um, <laughs> What we actually care about in some sense is the, uh, the thing that affects convergence, at least at the solution, is the uh, Jacobian, actually the eigenvalues of the Jacobian at the solution itself. 
And those are, that's hard to characterize though. You need like power iterations to do that. So a very, very rough approximation for controlling the stability is to control the Frobenius norm of the Jacobian at the solution, right? Just the norm of the Jacobian at its solution. And the nice thing about this is that it's very possible to create, you know, a, a, again, a crude, but, but good estimator for this using the Hutchinson estimator, um, basically, which, which, which lets you approximate that Frobenius norm using essentially a few more forward passes of your function. And if we do this, what we find is that we're able to basically, um, uh, this, this plot here shows when we, when we add regularization uh, with this function, we're able to converge with the same number of iterations, like capping our iterations at say, you know, five or 10 iterations, we're able to much more accurately find, a, find an actual fixed point um, by controlling the Jacobian norm in this manner. The other thing we can exploit is better solvers. So we use the Anderson. The Anderson is a great solver. It's like a, a generic general purpose um, uh, neural solver, but, sorry, it's a general purpose solver, but we can use better solvers than this. And there's been a whole trend in deep learning actually on building essentially neural network based solvers themselves. So using neural networks to propose iterates of an iterative solution procedure. Now in general, I, I'm actually kind of skeptical of these things. <laughs> and, um, it, it's very hard to build general purpose solvers like a better gradient descent that works better period using some neural network. However, the problem we have here that we often want to solve is very simple because if you just care about inference speed for these networks, you actually can build a solver for your fixed point that is custom written, custom optimized basically, for finding fixed points of this particular network, just given different inputs, right? And again, because for a given input, we want to find its fixed point. Um, and so the idea that we do is we actually develop just sort of a, uh, a slightly more involved uh, variant of Anderson acceleration where we learn the convex combination of previous iterates, not by the Anderson formula, but by a neural network itself, All right? And that neural was trained on the actual learned deck model and they can accelerate the inference, the inference time uh, drastically. So what we see is, what I'm showing here are some sort of uh, basically Pareto curves for the solution quality. Uh, here's uh, Wikitext 103 where we're evaluated with perplexity where lower is better. And what we see is by this, 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 this point here is ours. Um, if we do all these things, so regularize it usually and, um, and add this hyper, hyper Anderson solver, et cetera, we get pretty close to, the, to sort of that point, not quite there, I'll admit, not, not quite there, but we can, you know, by, by, by tuning the number of iterations of the same, basically, we can get solutions which are, which are very, very close in quality, uh, or a little better in quality and which are very close in the runtime as well. So obviously where, where you wanna be in this figure is sort of down to the left, that's great performance with no runtime. And this point here is sort of the, the, the standard fixed depth network. You can see we can do better in quality if we want to, we just wanna to run for further, but that takes longer. And so with all these things, we can start to push our way down and to the left and get pretty close. We're not quite there yet, but in other domains we actually are, which is what I'm excited about. Uh, so this is this like with combining all these things, we can do very, very well um, to make these, these architectures competitive in terms of their inference time. Okay, so, so let me finally end now with going a bit beyond just this basic architecture. Yeah, question. Yeah, so since you talk about efficiency, I wonder are more traditional approaches like owning or mixed position? Uh, I see. Work yeah, so that's a great question. So the question was like, you know, because we're talking about efficiency here, could we just do things like prune the network too or stuff like this? Um, or, you know, afterward compress them in some way. We haven't done too much of that. I'll be, I'll, I'll be straight We haven't done too much of that. We tested it a little bit and it seemed like you can do some amount of distillation with a deck model, sort of like create a smaller variant of the, of the deck model. But this is really saying like, if we keep the network size the same, can we get inference faster? So this is really dealing with the inference problem, or I mean, that, that, that the, the solution problem rather than the network complexity itself. If we keep the cell complexity kind of equivalent, how can we push it down? But I think we probably could apply things like um, pruning or weight, weight compression or other things like that as well. I'm a little bit curious about uh, like, because we're doing the same. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you see, pruning may have a different consequence. 
It might, but but I think that I, I don't see any reason to think printing would have a different consequence. Actually, um, you have a bit more width in your network, so you have a bit more freedom to prune, you know, different different parts of the space. I just haven't seen a notable difference in terms of the actual performance, like you might expect to, um, just just inherently. So, I, I guess I would I would sort of say like I I, I haven't. We haven't done those experiments, so I don't know, and I probably shouldn't like speak until I, I do know, but I suspect it wouldn't have a big effect. Like I suspect it would also work there. Yes. <coughs> yeah. Do we know if it's as easy to make like the hardware for Oh, that's a great question. Like parallelism. Oh, so yeah, so, so parallelism all, so this is also run on GPUs, right? Because the, the, the key um, compute timing for root finding for Anderson is just running the forward pass, right? It's just actually computing the forward pass through this one cell. There's a much cooler question here, which is to say, finding a fixed point is actually a very like analog-esque operation, right? Which is actually the cooler, the cooler idea, um, which is a really cool idea, by the way. But, you know, also, by the way, mentioned in those first papers on recurrent backprop and not realized 40 years later now, so maybe not as cool as he might sound at first. Um, for the most part, all this stuff works just as well on the hardware that we have because the, the, the bottleneck is still running that one block um, and you just do that a bunch of times and that just uses GPUs like everything else. So we use, all this is in PyTorch still, it is not hard to do, it's all still in our, in our normal solvers. Um, the cool idea about of, of this is can we build hardware that somehow natively finds fixed points, not through iterative procedures, but through some sort of, you know, natural stabilizing equilibrium? Because by the way, that's what, you know, rectifiers do, right? Like this, this, this is sort of, this is like how, or sorry, op amps uh, do. Um, like this seems like it should be possible, but while that's really cool and I would love to do that more, uh, we haven't been successful at it yet. I also don't build hardware, so you know maybe that's why. <laughs> I talk to people about this. There isn't a clear cut case, but it's super interesting, and it might be clear in the future. Um, I don't have anything more to say about that right now. Um, it's it's because this part is not do it. This, this is sort of post training. Um, you don't get the benefit of neural solvers. You do get benefit from the regularization, though. So training efficiency on the order of like two, three times worse or so, three times slower. Whereas then finally solving it once you've trained it is like one and a half times slower. Um, not great. One more thing I should mention um, is that as much as I've talked up implicit differentiation here, we actually don't use it that much in practice. What we actually use in practice are inexact gradients based upon a few more forward iterations of the fixed point iteration after we're done that you then backprop through. So one really nice thing about this actually is you can use inexact gradients. Um, but I'll, there, there's the, I, I can point out some papers on that, actually not, not from our team, from other people doing it. Um, it lets you train a bit faster, but training is still slow. You still have to solve the fixed point as you train. Okay, so in the time I have left, which is not much, let me um, make my final point, which is that I think we spent a lot, so, so I'm, I'm really excited about all this work, but if I actually look at it, like, you know, I'm really excited, but these things haven't taken over the world yet. Like, why not? I mean, deep learning moves really fast. This is like ancient now. This is like three years ago, we, we first published this paper. Why haven't they taken over the world? They're so great. And I think I have to, I mean, I think the problems I mentioned are the big problems. Like, you know, they're a bit slower, um, key in training, stuff like this. But I think the real problem, honestly, is that we've been focusing on tasks where deep networks work pretty well. <laughs> Just speaking, speaking truthfully. Image classification, it, it, they, they, they work as well, but like so deep networks work really well for image classification. And so what I'm most interested in are finding situ now going forward, are finding situations where these models, they really enable some fundamentally new functionality or new sort of improvement that we can't easily embed in existing deep networks, but which we can embed here. And so this next, I have three examples of this. I'm gonna go through quickly because we only have five minutes left. But 
they hopefully at least give some hint of what we might be able to do going forward and domains where I am currently most excited about these equilibrium models. The first of these is in problems that involve simultaneous inference in the network, so forecast in the network and optimization. There are a lot of cases where you want to optimize over the inputs of a network to accomplish some function. So imagine like you want to find, you know, a, a general, uh, you want to find a latent state for some generative model that produces an image that's as similar to something as, you know, as similar to some other image as you want, right? Um, the way you would do this is you would generate images from that latent state and then perform gradient descent over some loss function on that latent state to optimize your image. Right, this is sort of how you do it. And there's, there's many examples where you, of this, where of course, where you want to optimize an input to a deep network. Input meaning the actual, like the X input to your network. What's really cool here, so, and how do you do this? Well, if you do this, well, you optimize that input with gradient descent, right? You take small gradients of your output loss with respect to the input and you optimize it. The very cool thing about this is that if you use, if your network you're trying to optimize over is an equilibrium model, well, your gradient descent update that's a fixed point iteration. Your model is a fixed point iteration. So I can combine, remember the, the notion that like, you know, two equilibrium models is really just one equilibrium model. I can actually treat my whole problem as finding a joint equilibrium of my gradient descent procedure and my original deck network. And this is a very subtle point, but I think it's really, really cool here. The point is we can treat sort of the problem globally of input optimization and kind of finding a fixed point as one joint optimization problem or really one joint fixed point problem and solve them simultaneously. And the idea is, you know, we can do much less work in that case because we don't have to wait for the network to converge before we take some gradient steps over the input, right? We can sort of just do these things both naturally together. And we actually, again, this, this is a paper we had at, at NeurIPS last year. Um, and there's some examples, and this is, you know, these are small examples, very clear, uh, using uh, generation from, from, from VAE models, where we basically show that if you do this optimization simultaneously, uh, where, you know, your, your, your generator basically of these models is a, a deck model, and you're optimizing over the latent state into that generative model, if you do this both at the same time, you can much more quickly find good samples that minimize your loss than if you sort of take a gradient step, generate a whole image with multiple layers, take out a gradient step, generate a whole image, et cetera. So at a high level, when you care about optimization, you can very nicely embed together the deck forward pass itself and the optimization procedure because these are both fixed point iterations. Um, another sort of pet peeve of mine is that, you know, I was talking about implicit layers because decks use implicit differentiation to compute their back prop, uh, their, their back prop. but at the same time, this other field tried to co-opt the term implicit as well in deep learning under the term implicit representations, which by the way, makes way less sense in that context than in ours. <laughs> I know there's people here that work on this, so I don't want to <laughs> don't want to say too much. But, um, however, you know, not being ones, we don't want to miss out on the game here. So we actually also last year at uh, at at at, uh, at uh, for a nurse paper, we were looking at these things and I realized actually that there are many things about deck models that make them very good as models for implicit representations, like nerfs or like sirens, these sorts of things. These, uh, neural fields, I think, is the new term they're being used for, but it hasn't quite caught on yet. Um, the idea being that uh, these implicit representations, i.e. I'll call them neural fields from now on, nerfs and things like this, they typically are trained with large batch sizes. They, um, they, they use this, they want to find like a fixed point on the same thing again and again. So, so essentially like as you're training them, you're training them all on, on large batch, they will benefit from memory consumption. You also can reuse past fixed points as initializations of, of your, of your um, 
fixed point iteration to converge much more quickly. And without getting too much detail, because it's in the paper, um, by using these implicit models for implicit representations, we have models that both work better, are more memory efficient, and actually in many cases faster to train than other models. Um, okay. And finally, uh, I want to mention one upcoming paper where we actually are able to get state-of-the-art results with DEX. And this is in the domain of optical flow, All right? So why, why is it? It's optical flow basically given some, given some image, you wanna to try to estimate sort of a, a vector direction of where each, of, of, of how each uh, point in that image is moving. And um, recent work has actually been using deep networks for this. So, so we've sort of transitioned away as a field. If, if you want state-of-the-art optical flow, you should not use uh, Lucas Kanata anymore. That's sort of, was a great heuristic, but it's not the best thing you can do. There are lots of deep networks now that outperform it. However, what we find is if we use a DEC approach instead, we actually achieve the state of the art in this, in this thing. So we, so we have the state of the art currently and continue to, if you just, I mean, whatever modifications we, that, that people have made, even since our paper, we can port them to a DEC framework and get even better. So we get things that are genuine state of the art here. Um, while using far less memory and actually in this case being faster. And the reason they're faster is if you think about what optical flow does, optical flow is tracking kind of how pixels are moving in an image. And so if you have like one frame in the image, you know, you might have to go through a whole bunch of solves to find your fixed point, which would predict how the pixels are moving in that image. But on subsequent frames, they're probably moving in very similar ways, right? You know, linear motion will continue in that same way. Not always, but many times. And so when you amortize over multiple frames, these subsequent solve times are much shorter and you end up sort of vastly improving. Oops, I missed one. I think I had the wrong frame there. Uh, and you end up vastly improving over the quality of solution um, and the, the, the memory efficiency of the solution and now also speed. So, so this is coming up this year in CVPR, but it's one of the first examples where we really are getting not just sort of nice conceptual models, but actually surpassing the state of the art using these deck models. Okay, so I'm done now. But what I sort of want to end with here is just some, a few final thoughts. Um, first of all, I think deep equilibrium models are, I mean, I'm biased of course, right? Because we came up with, I mean, <laughs> we've been developing them in my group, but I think they provide a really nice different framework for thinking about deep networks. Where the power of deep networks doesn't come from repeat, from, from explicit depth. It comes from this notion that repeating nonlinearities, including like repetition in terms of finding a fixed point of nonlinearities is the primary uh, primitive operation that we care about instead of convolutions or uh, rel use or, or whatever else we're gonna use in, in, in particular. Number two, I think this work draws really nice connections between deep learning and scientific computing more broadly. Right, so if you think about scientific computing, it is all about solving equilibrium problems, right? About uh, <laughs> computing the roots of nonlinear systems. This is what we've been doing for ages in scientific computing. And I think that we are just sort of scratching the surface in bringing all those lessons from scientific computing into deep learning. And these sorts of models provide a very nice foundation for doing so. Finally, I think we should think about what are the domains best suited to this and how do they fit in to a broader framework here? And you know, maybe at the very last, maybe we can think of a return to shallow, but of course, implicit and very structured learning. So the papers on all this are on my webpage, also this tutorial I mentioned before, uh, but it's been, been wonderful being here and happy to answer any, any additional questions right now. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, Chen, physics and simulation as a future area of research. Yes. Have you already done any experiments in that? For example, learning surrogate models for some PEs? Yeah, so so I mean, I've done a, we done a lot of work in my group on sort of learning simulation models in the loop of deep, of deep networks. But to be honest, um, we haven't done as much on the combination of deck models, sort of naturally using deck models for surrogate models, for example. It's an obvious thing that we probably should be doing, um, but we haven't done too much of it yet. So I would love to do more of that, right? I would love to see like, are these in some sense, it would seem to me like the bias of these networks, I mean, using the term bias very loosely, right? The, the structure of these networks is very well suited to modeling physical problems because physical problems are ones that often are finding minimum energy configurations and stuff like this, right? They're, they're, they're actually solving a fixed point system in some, in some space. Um, I think that's actually what's happening in the optical flow example. Like, like that also is an optimization problem, but one kind of also driven by data. And they are really good at combining these two things and so I think that you know, my hope at least would be that they will work better there, but we need to do more work to find out if that's true or not. Cool, thank you. But for example, I mean, just to give an example of this, you know, uh, as one maybe, I mean, we didn't do any of this work, of course, and I'm, I'm using it uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe uh, like a bit aspirationally here, but um, AlphaFold, for example, actually relied heavily on wait time, among other things. Like, so that's, that's pretty interesting, right? Like these things seem to be around, mm -hmm in models that are in fact state of the art for modeling physical things. And it seems likely that this, this, these things are related to me. Oh, yeah. right. <laughs> I guess I, I was curious if uh, people had looked into like composing them by injecting another output. That would basically be like, instead of that, so 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 like yeah so so this is i mean maybe but this is actually where i would say that this kind of in some ways goes against the philosophy of decks to me because if you're composing decks the whole idea is that this is can be framed as one equilibrium point like you don't need to solve one then the other but solve them simultaneously i guess the question then becomes like is there a value in not just injecting by like adding, but maybe doing something? Like oh, I see. So like instead of input yeah. injection being, being um, I mean, I, even with like multiplicative injection, that can also be stacking. Even if you don't like, you can also, sorry, that you can also capture like multiplicatively injected uh, inputs as a single, as a single equilibrium point. That's sort of problem one. It's, it's not just, um, it's not just like, addition the addition of an input injection it is literally any functional input or any function of the input can be described as one stacked equilibrium model but i think of course there is opportunities and room for um for improvement there i don't know who was actually sorry i'm, I'm not sure you, 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 you go, go go ahead <laughs> oh there's a question in the chat too um, okay, so the question in the chat was, can you talk a bit more about why the usual hierarchical deep learning theory is not entirely accurate? Yeah, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit um, maybe informal here, where like, it's hard to say it's not accurate, because clearly there are hierarchies that are formed in deep learning. I would just say that like, what's typically the case is that we, we place a lot of emphasis on depth as the key aspect of deep learning and you know different layers being the key things and i would just emphasize here that that, that um the point i would make is that the fact that these equilibrium models work implies to me that the depth alone is not the whole story it's not like just different operators you know sequence after one after the other are the, are the important thing it really is a matter of what's the fundamental unit of compute that we care about. And I think that fixed point um, finding is a more powerful and perhaps better representation of deep networks than composition of functions. I should mention we're well over time here. So feel free to, I mean, people already have, but to, to, to imply you should, all, you should all head off. We can, the rest can be kind of off. I will try to answer all the chat questions, but I also want to let people go if they need to. Oh, there's also food in the back. I didn't even know about this, so it's fantastic. Um, but I'll, I'll just I'll just keep going answering questions now. So feel free to stick around if you're if, if you're interested. Um, there's one more in the chat. I'm going to try to answer here. So it says, 
Throughout this talk, I found myself thinking about the fixed, fixed point of message passing in graphs. Oh, fixed point of message passing in graphs. You apply decks to graph neural networks and there are cases. Yes, so um, just to be clear, the, the question is sort of about, about uh, graph neural networks, these sorts of things. So we haven't directly, but the short, but, but I, I really would like to. <laughs> um, we haven't yet had like a graph deck. There, there's sort of been similar things to be clear to uh, done. And I think that there has been some like graph deck like like papers, but we haven't done that directly yet. However, absolutely it should be done. <coughs> um, we've done some more actually in graph transformers uh, in different contexts. And I, I actually really want to make a deck version of it. We just haven't really gotten around to it. So definitely should happen. Cause exactly it's like, you know, fixed points. It's, it's, it's like belief propagation, right? It's converging to some, some, some fixed point. It makes total sense. Yes. So even though people are going to leave for the social, I think we should finish asking questions because there'll be like, a, there's audience on Zoom and not like what you do. Yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll keep going until it is. Yeah, so, so, right, so someone mentioned belief propagation is a deck. Yeah, like every fixed point is a deck, right? Like if that's the great thing about it. <laughs> I can like all the fixed point iteration as, as, as just being an instance of our great model. Um, uh, but absolutely right, yes. So, so the cool thing about this is that there's, such a connection here. So, so, and this is what I like about that, that second to last thing I sort of mentioned is that when you have a process where you both want to simultaneously solve like a forward passenger network and some explicit belief propagation or optimization or, 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 or graded descent procedure, you can do these simultaneously within this framework, which is really nice. So, um, so when I answer this, does the fixed point solution always exist? Uh, definitely not. Uh, it's very hard to prove that it exists. But however, this is this is why, and it was it was very brief, I know. So it doesn't really um, the the full point didn't get across here. But the under certain conditions, you can guarantee. This is this monotone uh, operator deck model. Under certain conditions, you can guarantee there's a fixed point solution. And I think this is still with nonlinearities and linear, you know, simple linear units. You can have convolutions there too. That all works. Under these conditions, you can guarantee that a fixed point will, will, will exist. Now, this, these are sufficient but not necessary conditions. So definitely there can be fixed points without these things being true. But you can, if you want to, consider a, a special class of these problems that have fixed point solutions, guaranteed to have them. Yes, one more question. So I, one of the kind of underlying assumptions here is that uh, we're trying to like find these fixed points. but Iterated application of a map can also converge to other things like limit cycle. Yeah. Do you have a case. notion of why fixed points is the right notion? Yeah. Whether okay. limit cycles might be a useful alternative? So I actually love the idea of, of, of a different version that converges to a limit cycle. Thinking about a limit cycle conversion instead. I mean, you can always, in some sense, like think about limit cycles in terms, for a discrete case, at least, about like an expanded version of a, of a deck that like actually like incorporates the whole limit cycle in a bigger in a bigger version, but that would be actually very, very inefficient. And so you might want to actually have like a different variant where you apply different functions for some fixed period and look for a limit cycle conversion. That's actually a super cool idea that we just started thinking about recently. Um, so the reason why I like fixed points as opposed to like limit cycles stuff like that is that like they, they, they are more well-defined, right? And you can at least theoretically capture the notion of a limit cycle at least in a discrete sense within a single fixed point. So there, there is a way in which like these are, to me, a bit more natural than considering limit cycles. And just practically speaking, even though we don't have guarantees for normal networks, they converge to typically fixed points, not to limit cycles, right? So, so we, we don't often see limit cycles in practice unless, I mean, sometimes maybe, but we either see sort of like chaos <laughs> if it's going to diverge with like, if it diverges and you normalize something like that, then you can see like just, just kind of chaos, or something like this, or you see a fixed point. You typically don't see well-behaved limit cycles. And so that's why we sort of go with fixed point instead of limit cycles. But what I think is cool is the idea of actually applying different function maps to enforce a limit cycle with a certain period um, as an alternative to, to sort of a single fixed point. Yeah. This is very uh, related to you know, neural ODs. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. This is uh, right. Uh, this is closely related to you know neural ODs and diffusion models, and these models are now uh, one of the things for which they're known is kind of like uh, sampling, like imagination yeah. stuff. 
right? And this is also kind of conspicuously absent. From yeah, it's true. I, so I, I, I don't I'm have. Sure you thought about this? So. I definitely thought about this, and I'm I am like completely uh, sad that we have not yet published a paper on like generative equilibrium models because also as a gem would be the acronym. So we have even a cool acronym. Um, I have not yet found a generative model that I'm like really happy with in this setting. So let's take diffusion models. Diffusion models in some sense like seem like a natural, natural fit. It's like, look, these are things. The problem with diffusion models is that they rely too much. So diffusion models rely very heavily on, um, on two things. They rely on noise that is generally different each time step. So like you can't apply the same noise, then they, 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 they become degenerate and they don't really work. And it's actually not that easy. It's like, like fixed point solutions, there, there aren't really natural like stochastic equivalents of these things, right? Like it's not a supernatural mapping there. Um, but maybe the bigger issue is that in most diffusion models, the initial state, the initial random, so like just think about running the packwork process now, like, like the, the, the process of, of going from a noise to an image. Um, the influence of the noise on the image happens only through the initial state. There isn't the equivalent of an input injection. And what this means is that, and you, you can force it to be there, but it's not that natural to do this actually. And what this means is that the final image you get, like it is sort of, it's critically stable in a way. And, and what, what I mean by that is like, if you define an iteration that sort of carries out the backward process and like things of the backward process, meaning like the generation process as, as the, 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 the fixed point of some input, um, you get a system where the final state is sort of an image is a stable, regardless of what that, that, that input noise was. So it's like, you don't have an immediate dependence of the input except to the whole chain of things. One really nice property here is that decks are by their definition path independent. So it doesn't matter how you get from the starting state to the, to the final state, all that matters is the final state. Diffusion models are critically path dependent, right? So like how you get, even though you don't care about the path, how you traverse the path to get to the final solution affects what that solution is. And so that's where that connection breaks down. Oh, this is, this is we found it to break down, uh, found it to be breaking down. And I, I, I'm super unsatisfied with this because there seems like so obvious. I mean, to be clear, like everything is, is, is like um, MCMC, that's a fixed point iteration in function space. Like everything's a fixed point iteration. We should absolutely be using uh, generative, you know, we should actually be doing generative models for all these things. But I haven't found, like we, we just haven't found something that I think is, you know, worthy of the name gem. Yeah, so, so when we do, you know, you can, you can like read the, read the titles and archive or whatever. I'm like, when that comes up and, and we're the authors, then you'll know that we found it, so. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I have, there's one more on, online too. So, so given an input X is the Z we find through optimization, the final output that we need. Oh yeah, so, so the question was like, is the Z star the final output? So, so no, typically like what we do, just to be clear is we have one layer after the Z too. So like you find the fixed point, um, after Z star, but then you apply one, just like you take the final features of a network and you know, apply one last layer to get like classes, you typically pass Z star to the final function. Yeah, so just practically speaking, there, there is one more function you execute before you actually um, do that because you don't want your fixed point iterations like depend on like the number of classes you have or things like that. Yeah, question. Hi. Uh, one of the things you seem to be just suggesting is that the deep networks are learning the computational graph of a fixed point iteration algorithm. Uh, is that like a fair statement? Um, so I don't know if the deep net, oh, oh you, you, mean, you mean I'm claiming that like most deep networks are doing something similar to this, yes. like there's something more. That, so that's a, that's a, that's a uh, <laughs> maybe, but I'm much less certain about that. So. What I would say is there's a way in which enforcing fixed point solutions and enforcing traditional compute graphs give very similar, both kind of qualitatively and performance wise uh, performance <laughs> and, and, and quantitative performance, right? Um, 
I personally think there probably is some element in which like traditional networks are doing some weird approximation of like finding a fixed point through their iterations anyway. Mm -hmm. But that's a weaker, that's, that, that, that's a much weaker statement, right? I, I think I have a hard time really making that statement precise because they're just compute graphs, right? Like yes. they can do anything what they want. Um, so it's, it's hard for me to argue that, that these are really fundamentally like finding a fixed point because they're different weight. I mean, most networks are not weight tied, right? Mm -hmm. They're not. Um, I would argue actually that most weight tied networks are doing something like this. So they're, 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 they actually are executing like, like a fixed point. They're executing a fixed point iteration to be clear. Um, but normal networks, I mean, I sort of think maybe there's some similarity there, but I think that's, that, that, that's a harder statement to make. I see. Thank you. All right, I think that's it. I think we've actually tapped out all the questions or at least exhausted everyone.